morning crypto. And then um, I went to the White House and uh, I spent 11 days in the White House. And this happened on a Wednesday. And the reason I know it was a Wednesday, I was only there for one Wednesday. So I know it was a Wednesday. And I was in the Roosevelt room, which is off the Oval Office. And there were two Fed representatives and they were presenting a white paper on the potential digitization of the US dollar. You can go back, this was July of 2017. And I walked into the meeting and they were explaining what they wanted to do. And of course it didn't happen, but I said, wait a minute, this the blockchain? Is it blockchain? And these two young men were owners of Bitcoin and they believed in the blockchain. And I remember saying to myself, okay, I've got to understand this better. The Winkle bosses are probably right. I'm obviously dense. I went back to my office. I wrote down some notes. About four days later, I got fired. About five days after that, I bought the URL uh, skybridgebitcoin.com. And then I got very frightened because I was like, okay, it's probably not the right thing to do. I've got all these institutional investors. So I made a list. I said, three things have to happen for me to buy my first Bitcoin. And number one, Bitcoin has to get to or close to 100 million wallets because therefore there would be a network effect and it would have an exponential expansion. Second thing I had to get comfortable with was regulation. I had to believe that the United States wouldn't ban Bitcoin or do something nefarious to Bitcoin. And so uh, if you really study U.S. property law, once the IRS said that Bitcoin was intangible property, I knew we were fine. I knew that there would be no way that a regulator, a czarist regulator, you know, like a Gary Gensler could block something like this. Just the court system in the U.S., the common law system would protect you. And then the third thing is I had to get comfortable with a custody. If I was going to buy nine figures worth of Bitcoin. And so when all of that materialized in November of 2020, we started buying Bitcoin. Good morning, Warriors. Hello and welcome back to another episode of your favorite crypto news channel, Good Morning Crypto, where we bring you the most relevant and impactful crypto-related topics from a top crypto research team in the world. And Gonzo, I wanted to start off with that video. I know it was a little bit longer this morning for an introduction into the show, but the reason I wanted to show that is because he highlighted three major catalysts that needed to happen before we saw mainstream adoption of Bitcoin. We've gotten two of those we're just waiting on regulation here. But first of all, how are you feeling this morning, my friend? Thank you for being here. I'm feeling good, man. It, it was a great wing weekend. Got to spend some time uh, with my granddaughter and, you know, do, do some work and stuff. And I'm just excited because uh, it's been a long six months on this schedule. And this is the last week that I'll be uh, working the schedule and flipping. So next week, uh, if, you know, if you'll have me, I'll, I'll be around more during the week. So that'll be cool. I'm excited for that. Absolutely, guys. And we already got 466 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button. And while Cashflow is figuring out his camera, we're going to break down this first article here. As Kathy Wood is calling for a financial superhighway when it comes to Bitcoin, reiterating her $1.5 million price target by the year 2030. And we've talked about this for a while on our show, how she talked about raising this from $1 million to $2 million, and she's safe calling it $1.5 by 2030. Well, the ARK Invest CEO says the firm has been closely looking at the emerging markets where use cases of digital assets make her believe that Bitcoin is partially a risk-off asset. Kathy Wood called Bitcoin a financial superhighway, emphasizing the importance, the important use cases of cryptocurrency in emerging markets. She said the asset manager is focused on emerging markets and the macro environment worldwide, which has been shocked by the U.S. Federal Reserve's increase in recent interest rates. There are signals that not all is well in the world, said Kathy Wood. And because of that, Kathy sees Bitcoin as a risk off versus a risk on asset. ARK Invest Spot Bitcoin ETF became one of the more successful Bitcoin ETFs among the 10 funds issued in January. Wood said that with more institutions emerging in this space, mathematically speaking, Bitcoin's price could easily rise above $3.5 million. However, she wouldn't give a new specific price target. Bitcoin has miles to go, said Kathy Wood, with a call of 1.5 million by the year 2030. So I think we got Andrew back here, Gonzo, but I want to start with you real quick. Give me your thoughts on Kathy Wood raising her price targets, but 3.5 million seems extremely bold. Is this a bull market narrative because prices are moving or is this what she actually believes? What's your opinion? Well, look, she's not wrong about what's going on with the Fed and the money printing and that you need to have something, right? The way that inflation runs... And the only trick that they have in the book um, 
we know that this is going to continue to happen. And then you add the de-dollarization narrative and what's going with the BRICS nation. You know, the future does not look well for the dollar, right? So you got to find something. Um, I, I think, look, can it go to 1.5 million? To be honest with you, I don't know. But for right now, I feel like it's a narrative so that when these normies come in and they start looking at, well, prices at like 60, 70,000, it, should I be buying? You hear Kathy Wood saying it's going to 1.5 million. That's how people get caught at the top, right? Like I, I always like, I want to be present and then like follow what's happening right now. You know, we haven't even like held a daily, we haven't held a weekly candle above our all time high, right? Which kind of kicks off the next phase, like putting us into like where we're on a clock for the bull run, right? Um, and we're already talking about 1.5 million. And I feel like it gets people's emotions going uh, and it gets them to FOMO. So like keep the emotions out of it. Can, can it go to 1.5 million? Maybe at some point in the future, but is it going to go to 1.5 million in this cycle? Uh, I don't think so. And we already got 729 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button. Andrew, I'm going to come to you on this one because I found this breakdown very interesting over the weekend. Solana is leading with 49% interest in blockchain ecosystems in 2024. This is the blockchain ecosystem's global traffic share from January 1st to March 18th of this year. Solana has 49.29% of global traffic when it comes to cryptocurrencies. Ethereum is second place at 12. And this is excluding Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not included in this chart. We also got BNB at 5%. XRP is not on this list. Hedera did sneak in as one of the last blockchains, taking up about 0.4% of global traffic on blockchains, Andrew. But here's what's really interesting about this whole narrative. First of all, we got Avalanche and Cosmos also in the top five. But Solana is dominating. It's it's leading by a wide margin. And we talked about why this is. It's two reasons. We got meme coins, the craze that's happening in the market right now, driving tons of people to create wallets with Solana and use that new blockchain. The second thing is it doesn't have the fees. So people are making profits. They're moving money around. It's much easier to participate in the Solana ecosystem as opposed to what's going on with Ethereum, where for every $100 you transact, they want to take $28 to $35 out of your pocket. So First of all, how you feeling this morning? And Andrew, and uh, what's your reaction to the Solana versus Ethereum data that we broke down? Hey, hey, good morning, good evening, good afternoon here from the Netherlands for 15 p.m. here. Um, yeah, there is a lot of stuff happening at the moment. Just a small remark about Katie Woods, you know, will Bitcoin be one and a half million or 2.5 million? I don't care. Um, imagine. The peaks will be every four years, two times higher. It takes us at least another eight years before Bitcoin will be at 1.5 million. So guys, keep that in mind. But if I would be Katie Woods and I would have been invested heavily in an ETF, I would tell everybody Bitcoin would go to one and a half million, even 10 million, I would tell them. Why? Because she wants to dump their Bitcoins on, on, the, on the retail investor. So. You know, and it doesn't matter, but if you have a long-term horizon, it's a good investment. But if you say, I want to be a little bit more active, then better buy the dips. So then about, about uh, Solana, uh, I still remember, it was, I think, two years ago. Solana only went down and down. And then we saw all the articles, even here in the show. Uh, Solana is dead. It is nothing. And it is over. It's game over. And there'll be only Bitcoin and maybe Ethereum. And, you know, that was crypto winter. Look what's happening now. I mean, I kept investing on the way down with Solana, just according to the, the people in my, my, my uh, uh, investor, smart investor program. They know it, it is the PCA1 strategy. Just keep investing on the way down. Keep dollar cost averaging on, in, in the crypto winter, which you see here in, in the purple or in the lower purple uh, band. And now, you know, we are ready to take the profits. And actually, I don't care if it is meme coins or if it is something else. But what is very nice, the fees are so low that it is nice to play with with. with uh, with uh, with Solana, because if you wanted to play previously four years ago with ETFs on the on the Ethereum blockchain, you know you had to pay fees of 100, 200, 300 dollars. It was insane. And now you know you can buy your ETF or you can buy your uh, 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 meme coin on, on on Solana. You can even buy and sell Solana. Send it back and forth. It's much nicer, much more user friendly because of the price. And yeah, and, and now I understand. Yeah, there is a whole hype 
around bit, uh, about uh, meme coins on Solana. So guys, take advantage of it. I hope you already invested in Solana and take some profits on the way up. Andrew, and we're seeing a ton of demand come from institutions as well, but retail is continuing to dominate this market. And that's a great sign for everybody who's listening to this show. Gonzo, we talked about this a bunch, and I just want to wrap up the Kathy Wood conversation. What she discussed is that the majority of U.S. banks won't add Bitcoin to their balance sheets because of a lack of regulation, even with the spot products existing today. That means in the next 12 to 24 months, when we do get proper regulation, we're going to see a second wave of demand come into this market, particularly for Bitcoin, if it's the first one to get approval. Now, we are going to get into some XRP content here, guys, but we already got 1,020 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button. We're getting a lot of comments in the live chat, in the live chat where they're talking about XRP being left behind. That's exactly why I have this article prepared for today. We're going to break down an update from uh, the conference that happened this week in Australia, the wave of innovation XRP Gold Coast. This is from Bill Morgan on Twitter. He said, I was recently struck by this graph and the excellent keynote speech that BC Backer gave at the wave of innovation. What he's showing you here is the 2017 and 2018 crypto cycle where Bitcoin did an 880% gain creating brand new all-time highs during that time, while XRP not only traded sideways, but basically traded downward during the entire period. Once Bitcoin broke its all-time high and had a short-term regression, that liquidity flooded into XRP, creating the biggest liquidity wave we've ever seen. A 70,000% gain in only 240 days in the crypto market has not been seen since for a top 10 project in cryptocurrency. We've seen it with Shiba Inu, we've seen it with Dogecoin, We've never seen one of these top 10 projects do something like this during a crypto bull run. Last thing I want to do before I kick it to Gonzo here, I actually tweeted out this correlation several weeks ago because Waters pointed it out in one of his videos. This is a screenshot directly from his YouTube content. XRP breakout happens after Bitcoin breaks its all-time high. In April of 2017, while Bitcoin is passing all-time high, XRP was 90% down sparking concerns it was being left behind during this crypto cycle. XRP went on to complete a 70,000% gain in 240 days during the crypto bull run. And the question I asked our listeners was, do you really believe XRP is being left behind this time? Gonzo, that's where I'm going to kick it to you because I do not believe that. I think it's very important to rely on the data from previous cycles to get a little bit of insight into what we're going into. Bitcoin broke its all-time high, had a three-week regression, and it was a full-on explosion going up to $20,000 after only reaching about $1,200 during the previous cycle. Well, XRP was still trading 90% below its all-time high, and that's exactly what we're seeing today. So with everybody being overly negative and kind of pessimistic when it comes to this project, these are some optimistic signs that very valuable and very smart educators in our community are putting out. VC backer presenting this at the Wave of Innovation, in my opinion, does give it some validity. What's your opinion, Gonzo? Yeah, you know, it's not anything even like too crazy. Like if you look at all the charts and the way that the altcoin season popped off, you need Bitcoin. That's why we always focus on Bitcoin, not because we're Bitcoin maxis, is because Bitcoin leads the market. And we know from previous cycles when Bitcoin makes its all time high, that's where you're going to get these other projects, especially the top 10 that start to move. XRP just made a bigger move, right? But when you go down the risk curve, you had projects like Matic, Solana in its first cycle. That were either at a few cents or a few dollars and absolutely in a matter of weeks like just exploded right and that's why we always follow bitcoin it's because once it makes its all-time high that liquidity transfers and so we can go back on our past kind of history and then we hit these data points and what you do is you keep an open mind right and so we're going to have to wait until this thing plays out until bitcoin kind of tops out and then see what happens so that we can judge XRP, right? Just like Love Songs was asking in the chat about the 5.3 theory. Um, if you know Steve from Crypto Crew University, he's the only one that talks about it, but basically there's a mathematical formula. If you take Bitcoin's percentage gains from its uh, bottom to top and all the cycles, when you divide it to 5.3, it gives you the percentage gains for the top of the next cycle. And it's played out like pretty much exactly in every single cycle. So when you go from the bottom of our cycle to where the gains are, right? Uh, I don't have the math in front of me, so I won't give you the math numbers, but it diminished returns. Bitcoin's supposed to top out at 79,000, right? And so we won't know if that is a valid theory or if it gets null and void until Bitcoin breaks 79,000, right? If, if Bitcoin hits 79,000, rolls over, and we look like we're at the end of the, the thing, then that looks like the 5.3 theory 
is live and well, right? Like it's playing out, right? And it's going to shock everybody, right? Bitcoin doesn't make it to 100K. It's going to shock everybody. It's going to go against what everyone is saying because everyone believes that we're going 100K. And that's why I keep an open mind. I'm going to wait to see what happens once we get like 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, then that theory is null and void and you, you know, you move on to the next data point. And that's what I think a lot of people are waiting for, Gonzo, because when we see Bitcoin break all-time highs and we go into price discovery, the altcoins are going to be dragged up as well. That's what the evidence tells us. we got 1,209 live listeners here. If you're enjoying this content, show us some love, smash that like button, and thank you for being here on this Monday morning. We are looking at the XRP one-minute price chart real quick before we get into our next article, because one of our listeners said, when GMC comes on, the XRP price starts pumping. We're just showing you the evidence right here, a little bit of validation on our part. But Gonzo, we got a bunch of exciting content to get into for today, and I just want to find the tweet that I'm looking for. So to close it out, Andrew, we're going to go into this quick video right here where a previous Ripple executive is talking about how they went out and met with over 200 companies back in the day, including Uber, Airbnb, Google, and Amazon. I wonder when this will come into effect. Let's hear what he has to say research in terms of what was broken with the financial system and, and the payment system. And we went out and visited with uh, Uber and Airbnb and, uh, and, and Google and, and the others. And what I realized is that these firms, we think of them as tech firms, but a large uh, part of what they do and the value they provide are payment. Amazon, for example, has 206 different uh, payment connections to facilitate merchant payouts for their uh, platform. And so, you know, they're pushing innovation. And uh, I don't think that they should be in the payment business. I think that they should use, you know, other technologies instead of, you know, and focusing on what they're really good at. And so, you know, their role right now has been to push innovation. And I, I think that's a good thing. But in the future, we're hoping that there's other solutions uh, like the ones Ripple provides so that they don't have to get in that research. And there will be a day when Ripple comes into the conversation, Andrew, but I want to give you the open floor. Feel free to comment on the Bitcoin correlation to XRP's price chart, as well as what we just discussed in that video. That is that you should separate the major companies and let them do uh, what, what they need to do and, and keep, keep payments somewhere else. And, I, and actually, I agree and I disagree because the, 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 the payment is an essential part of, of, the, of, of, of the product and the service. So, and if you are as a, as a big company, you're always dependent on banks, I would say, Create your own payment system. I mean, I mean uh, uh, start accepting uh, 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 cryptocurrencies. You know, so um, yeah, it, it's. I think it's a fantastic development. However, the the power of the and the dominance of the banking system is still this big. Guys, remember the time when we talk about Facebook and Libra. Who who un still remember that 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 days that actually government. And the banking system says, said to, to Facebook, no, you are not going to implement Libra. And why not? Because they would have taken over maybe 20, 30% of, of, of the money flow in the, in the uh, uh, or, or at least the customers, all customers would get an account in Facebook. You could have, uh, uh, get, get your whole money there. So this was so revolutionary that, it was a no-go, and I think that, uh, that, that our friend uh, Mark, uh, he said, okay, I'll, I will comply to that, but see what happens. And I think this is very yeah, uh, indicative for, for future possibilities, and not every big company will, will comply. Let's think a little bit about our friend uh, Elon. I think he will, be, he will be able to make a big and, and large payment system, and he will say that the F word, to the to to the to the banking system. It's a great example, Andrew. And we actually have a tweet from Elon prepared for this episode, so we may as well break it down right now. The circle will be complete, said Elon Musk on Twitter last night. This is actually from 4:45 a.m. this morning. So get some sleep, Elon. That's 1 a.m. on the West Coast. I don't know what he's actually indicating within this exact image, but he tagged the Dogecoin designer. And obviously, that's a certified account. It's got the blue check mark here. They got eight dollars a month to pay. That makes them legit here, Gonzo. So I want to get some thoughts from you. And obviously, I'm keeping it lighthearted this morning. But this is some pretty great information. I did see a video from Elon Musk last year where he talked about making X the everything app, copying what WeChat is in China. This is another step in the right direction. And um, I believe they already have 22 payment licenses across 22 states in the in the U.S. So they're definitely making an impact. 
Florida is one of those states. They have a huge population. So what does this mean to you? Do you see this and what do you think of it? You know, I hadn't seen that, but, you know, it doesn't surprise me because, you know, when you look at Elon Musk, when he sets out to accomplish something, he usually, you know, follows through and he accomplishes it, whatever it takes. Right. And this thing has been in the making for a very long time. If you look like when he created PayPal, he was looking to create a system that was outside of the regular money system. Right. But it didn't work that out that way. Right. It ended up just kind of funneling the, the fiat system that we have now. And so I think this is his second shot at it. Um, and so, but you see like what happens because, you know, we're in a tension market. We're very still kind of speculative. And so Dogecoin has been running, right? I think it's up. I don't know exactly what it is, but I think it's up in the double digits. So 10, 15% this morning. Uh, and that's going to keep happening, right? Every time that Elon uh, tweets or we talk about, um, you know, X turning into the next WeChat, you know, Dogecoin is going to continue to run, right? Or any other project that's associated with it, it it's going to run, right? Uh, and, and that's kind of where we're at. And going back to like the, the stories that we did about Ripple, right? Super bullish on the company Ripple, you know, and, and it just goes to show that we're still early on the utility part of this market, right? And and it just takes, it just, just depends on w what you're here for, right? We always talk about investment thesis. Are you here for a kind of a long-term thing? So you're going to invest in these things, that have the potential that have real world utility and you just have to be patient and hold on to them? Or are you going to be more of the narrative driven kind of trader, right? Or are you going to follow like narratives like AI and gaming or a combination of two, right? You could, you could have your ISO token portfolio, your XRP, XLM, HBAR. And I think you can still make money in these narrative driven um, uh, kind of uh, niches, right? Because at the end of the day, I'm, I'm here to kind of make profits, right? So that I can change my life and the life of, of of our academy and stuff like that, and so, but it all comes back to like, what is your investment thesis? What is your plan? And what are you trying to get out of this market? Agree with you, Gonzo. And we're going to roll into some interesting connections here. But we covered this article from last week where BlackRock launched its first tokenized fund, build on top of the Ethereum network. Here's where the question. Here's where the uh, rabbit hole gets really interesting. So. They partnered with this company called Securitize. And why does that matter to our community? Because Securitize raised $48 million in a Series B funding round. And this funding round was led by a couple of companies. Morgan Stanley's Tactical Value. So Morgan Stanley, we got Blockchain Capital, as well as Ripple participating in this funding round. So once again, no direct ties, no direct announcement, but Ripple is involved in these types of conversations. And People want to say this is a conspiracy. We are reporting facts about what is happening. It's up to our listeners and us to figure out what XRP's role is going to be and what Ripple is actually doing within these developments. But it is very interesting to see that BlackRock launched its first tokenized fund on top of Ethereum, but Ripple is involved in the company Securitize that they use to tokenize the assets. So very, very, very interesting in my opinion. And I did find a couple of interesting connections as well. So we broke down the Robbie Michnik um, investigation where... This is the man who's responsible for educating Larry Fink. He's currently the head of digital assets at BlackRock, and he started there in August of 2018. Well, Dropped XRP on Twitter broke down this interesting information where Robert Michnik has removed the time at Ripple from his current LinkedIn profile. Very interesting. And people are probably like, well, who is this guy? What's it really mean? I do want to play just a couple of seconds of this video right here, just so you can kind of get a feel for who this guy is. This is a video of Robert Michnik being interviewed by Yahoo Finance. He's talking about digital assets and an inflection point for the market. What I really want you to pay attention to is, first of all, there's a lot of background noise, but listen to this man and tell me if you think he's just talking about Bitcoin or if he's talking about the crypto markets overall. Here we go. Here with Robbie Michnik, who is the head of digital assets over at BlackRock. Thanks so much for taking the time here with yeah, us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. I mean, first of its kind event that we're seeing here in New York for Bitcoin Investor Day. You gotta tell us for BlackRock and how you're approaching and looking at and exploring Bitcoin and cryptocurrency more broadly. I mean, how did the conversation really matriculate within the firm? Yeah. Well, this has been a multi year journey for us, uh, starting back really. 2016 kind of time frame and as this space and this asset class has evolved over multiple years from a infrastructure perspective from a regulatory perspective from a client interest and focus perspective you've seen our strategy kind of evolve with that to so i don't want to the audio is so poor i don't want to play the whole video but the reason i wanted to play that initial clip gonzo is because did you hear what he said 
Our mission into this space, our journey into this space started when? In 2016. And he's referring to BlackRock. Well, Robert Michnick was actually working at Ripple in 2017. So it's interesting. He's like, our mission as a company for BlackRock started the digital assets all the way back in 2016. He was not a part of the company. And if he was, he was also working for Ripple. So a little background knowledge here is Michnick worked at Ripple in 2017 and then was directly hired at BlackRock in 2018, right after to be the head of digital assets. We're going to get into some other content. I just wanted to address this very briefly. This is the man who's responsible for educating Larry Fink. And I wanted to play that video because you can tell he seems very relatable. He seems very, I guess, normal would be the way I would describe him, which was like kind of reassuring. But what I really like is that he talked about the market reaching an inflection point and Bitcoin just being one part of that. He goes on to elaborate further into the clip. So I did want to get some of your thoughts, Gonzo. As a man who previously worked at Ripple, the next year is the head of digital assets at BlackRock. Well, he's now removed the Ripple employee from his LinkedIn bio, which is interesting. Why would that take place? I do not know. But let's have a conversation about it and whatever else stuck out to you. Um, yeah, you know, I I would let Larry Fink make a comment about why Larry Fink all of a sudden had a shift in the way that he was thinking about Bitcoin, whether it was the money grab, whether BlackRock was looking for the next new thing. I don't know. But what we can talk about is real world assets, right? Ever since Larry Fink has come out and talked about the uh, tokenization fund that they built on ETH, real world assets uh, has become a thing, right? And I think it's the very next narrative. And so there, there are certain proxy bets. And I think it was like gaming of last cycle. I think that the infrastructure is still not there yet, like they're still building. But there are certain projects that, you know, you can take proxy bets on because I think it's the next narrative, right? You could, at the very least, understand how real world assets work and understand that they need like oracles, right? It's because they need like price feed data. So you got projects like Link and Pith that's built on Solana that are probably going to do extremely well besides like the proxy bets that we've probably mentioned on this before, which is like Ondo, CFG, and OM. Remember, it's not exactly tokenization, but they're proxy bets, but we're very early in the real world assets narrative. So those projects are going to do extremely well. Just kind of like like the whole AI deep in thing where we were at a few months ago and that's kind of caught fire. I think that's the kind of next besides AI, deep in, GameFi, I think real world assets is the next narrative. But remember, it's still very, very early. So it's speculative. And so you're kind of making these proxy bets on, on what's going to do well. Nothing that I would personally hold kind of into the next cycle, but I think they're going to run extremely well in this next bull run. Andrew, we're going to get into a bunch of topics before the end of today's episode, but I want to remind our listeners, this is a big topic people are looking forward to. RippleX addresses the XRP ledger's AMM pool error and advises user caution. They're advising people to not enter certain liquidity pools because they found structural issues in, or sorry, a technical issue affecting the automated market maker pools on top of the XRP ledger. This is not for all pools. This is just affecting some, and it's been a rocky launch to say the least. But sticking with the conversation we're having now about tokenized assets, Andrew, this is the project that I'd really like to get your comments on. As Avalanche and Chainlink collaborate on an Australian on-chain asset settlement, the Australia and New Zealand banking group alongside Chainlink collaborated to connect Avalanche and Ethereum blockchains network for on-chain settlement solutions. They're in the process of tokenizing assets, and that's why this article is so important. Australia and New Zealand banking group, uh, as well as Chainlink Labs, have re released the results of a recent collaboration that aimed to collect the Avalanche network to the Ethereum blockchain networks for on-chain settlement solutions. ANZ used an interoperability solution provided by Chainlink called the Cross-Chain Interoperability Protocol, also known as CCIP, which allowed them to demonstrate how clients will be able to access, trade, and seamlessly settle tokenized assets across networks in different currencies. Through CCPIP, CCIP, ANZ simulated the purchase of tokenized assets on the Ethereum network at a price denominated in one stablecoin, with the transaction initiation and settlement occurring on top of the Avalanche blockchain using a separate stablecoin. So they're using Chainlink's interoperability protocol to allow these uh, stablecoins to communicate with one another and actually receive better rates. So this is like the best thing we could see when it comes to real world assets and the collaboration of other blockchains. It starts with AVAX, it starts with CCIP, but we can talk about how any blockchain is gonna need interoperability to be successful. Put Bitcoin to the side. This is one of the biggest problems with Ethereum. 
the gas fees, the, the amount that they want to charge per transaction, it's just not sustainable. And it's things like this that are going to provide solutions going forward. Andrew, first of all, what do you think about it being these two blockchains, AVAX and Chainlink, during this collaboration to help Ethereum? Second of all, how do you feel about this innovation taking place right now in 2024, while we don't even have regulation over here in the United States? It is, this, is, this, is, this is so great. This is fantastic because this proves, you know, it is just a, it, it's a tryout. It's a test case. But it proves it is possible, and you know, before the for before we get here in the in in the show, we always get some articles from apps. I'm always very amazed by the articles he found, and then I was thinking, what does it look like? And it, it it took me to the to the days of 1927 on the 20 and 20 and 21st of May 1927. What happened on that day? Charles Lindbergh flew by his own from New York to Paris in 33 hours. You know. And maybe it's it's a weird comparison, but normally a cruise ship would take five to seven days. So this was such an such an innovation, and still people were there and say, "No, I'm not going in an airplane." And look what's happening now: hundreds of airplanes are flying back and forth every day from from Europe to to uh, or over the oceans and over the world. So you know, it should start somewhere, and I'm very happy that that at least. A, a group, the, the Australian New Zealand banking group, you know, a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, for, for us a little bit, yeah, down, uh, down, down under, but they are taking the initiative to prove it works. And and if, if I would be the banking system in the US, I would get a little bit nervous about this. But I think it's very good for the public and very good for the for the innovation. So I would say it's a Charles Lindbergh event. <laughs> I like that. Andrew. That was a good connection there at the end. I was wondering, I'm like, how's he going to tie that back into the article? But that was awesome. Gonzo, we are going to move forward, but I didn't know if you had any additional comments on this article in particular. First of all, I've been a longtime proponent of Chainlink ever since the summer of 2023. You told me about Chainlink and I had, I had actually bought it in the prior cycle, but it was one of those tokens I just bought and I held. When I did my research, I got really excited. Two things, use cases, and partnerships. That's what really sticks out to me about Chainlink. I'll pull up the price chart, but what sticks out to you? Yeah, I mean, when you look at Chainlink, like how it started with Oracles and providing all of the, the data that it does to blockchain, and then it really changed the game with TCIP. Like, uh, and I remember like when we first talked about this story, right? Like uh, when, when they first kind of announced that they were doing this test. And you gotta remember like those were in the days when like Chainlink was in that five to ten dollar range, right? And AVAX too. Remember when AVAX had kind of collapsed down to like eight, nine dollars? So they were still at kind of reasonable prices. And if you're so, if you were able to kind of DCA, that's awesome because you're up by a lot. And so even now, like where we are in the market, um, you know, anywhere between fifty, sixty dollars for AVAX, I think is still reasonable. Same thing with like Chainlink when it back tested like seventeen, eighteen dollar range. Um, but you're, you're talking about two projects that are going to do extremely well. They're, obviously, they're not your 100x or something crazy like that. But what, as far as the risk curve, less risky, but less ROI. But yeah, I mean, these guys are going to keep building. Like CCIP is is literally like taking existing infrastructure for these banks and connecting it in the blockchain. They don't have to retrain anybody. They don't have to uh, like add anything new. It's just setting up all the back end stuff, right? Uh, and then AVAX with its subnet technology, like, you know, these guys, I think the future of blockchain is going to be interoperability. So anything that is interoperable is going to do extremely well. And it's kind of a long-term kind of investment for my investment thesis. And Gonzo, this is an, is an example of one of the partnerships that we were talking about. In June of 2023, Swift announced it was testing blockchain interoperability with over a dozen financial institutions on the Chainlink network. In a new interview with CNBC, Chainlink creator, can't pronounce his name, says that the collaboration with Swift was going very well and all key goals they wanted to were achieved during this collaboration. So I'll move forward, but I did think that was very important. And since I'm going to timestamp this AVAX and Chainlink, let's close it out with the AVAX price chart here, Gonzo, because this is one that we've been talking about privately, getting above that $50 range, trading above $60. It seems like AVAX, and we don't do price predictions, we're just talking here is on its way to a $100 token. We saw this reach $180 during the prior bull run. So it's not like that's a crazy price target. There are plenty of people who purchased higher than that, but it is a $21 billion project today at $58 in value. And I think this is one of the projects that will move a bunch during this bull market. As you can tell, 
Let me remove this like off the screen. We still are at the bottom of this accumulation zone. We are finally reaching those levels, that last level of resistance. It seems like it's really obvious when you look at it in these long-term time frames, Gonzo. That $65 range right up here, 60 to $65, that's the last, the last level of like real hard selling pressure, it seems like. Once we can break above these ranges, it seems like there's almost a clear road to $85, $88 here. And that's awesome for anybody who's holding this token or is a trader in this market and is looking to get into these markets, make a quick trade. This is a project that would be great to do some TA on. If you do some great TA, tag one of us on Twitter so we can show it on the show because we'd love to give that to our listeners as well. Gonzo, before we move on, any comments on the AVAX price chart? Yeah, you know, I, I think we had given it out as a call some weeks back when we got that pullback and we went below $50. I think I was talking about it in the academy that it's going to be a great entry because I think once it gets through, like you're talking about high time frame, right? This high high time frame trading. Once you get past that sixty dollar uh, area, I think the next stop is a hundred, right? We don't really have a lot of resistance until we get to a hundred dollars, right? And I think all time high is what like one fifty, um, and, and so um, yeah, same thing with like chain link. It's been kind of like grinding slowly at that like twenty dollar level. It's come down a little bit. But once it breaks a certain level, then it, you know, next stop is like 30 bucks and 30 bucks from there is like all time high, which I think is at 50. Absolutely, Gonzo. And that's why I want to talk about these types of projects, because maybe we talk a lot about Bitcoin and XRP because people love those two tokens. We also talk about like Solana and Ethereum now that they're making some money. But these types of projects are just as legit. And I want to make that very, very clear when we talk about things like Chainlink and AVAX. These are two blockchains that I definitely hold. I definitely believe in. And they have the partnerships and use cases to prove it. Whether it's tokenized assets, processing transactions, these are the blockchains, smart contracts as well. These are the blockchains that have good technology, even though there are better products. People might kill me in the live chat. XLM has cheaper rates than AVAX. It's true, but we're not at the point in the market where the best products are going to be controlling 100% of the market. AVAX is going to have a share. And I think this is just a great example of that, Gonzo. But let's get into some XRP content here as RippleX addresses the XRP Ledger's AMM pool. I'd love to start this conversation with a little bit of positivity. This is a update and a video from David Schwartz. It's five minutes long. We're going to play about two minutes, 20 seconds here because he breaks down the value of the XRP automated market maker and why, yeah, we may have a rocky road, but eventually when this is fully implemented, it will have an impact on not only XRP, but other assets using the automated market maker. Let's listen to David Schwartz and let us know what you think in the live chat. Here we go. Just the AMM. I am unreasonably excited about this for largely personal reasons. I've spent a lot of time studying things like trading strategies and Forex markets, and this is near and dear to my heart. Um, I also learned something that I didn't know, which is um, as I watched automated market makers develop on other chains, I sort of thought that automated market makers were better than order books. That like we implemented order books on the XRP ledger because it's sort of like the obvious thing. And then there's this really cool thing called an, called an automated market maker that most other like DeFi platforms are using, most other DEXs are using. And I learned as I looked into it that they're very complementary. They are not one or the other. One is not better than the other. They each have their own advantages and disadvantages. And the two of them together is way better than anything that you could get from having either one independently. And XLS30 is not just another AMM implementation. This was not the XRP ledger playing catch up. We were caught up with an order book. Um, this is a true innovation. The XRP ledger is a trusted and leading enabler of DeFi because the underlying architecture of the ledger combined with the protocol native design of the decentralized exchange and soon the AMM will address most of the pain points faced in the decentralized liquidity landscape today. The XRPL's DEX was launched in 2012, the first DEX in the world, tokenization of any asset, the ability to trade and move these tokens anywhere in the world in just seconds, and open globally competitive liquidity. Now, Adding AMM to that, AMM, first and foremost, as I think about it, most people think of an AMM, first and foremost, as providing liquidity. I think of it, first and foremost, as a trading engine. RippleX is focused on differentiating the world's first DEX through automated market making. The AMM specification is now on DevNet for testing, and it'll be available to vote on mainnet, I think, just in a, in a couple of days. But ultimately, I see the AMM as a trading engine. It executes a trading strategy on behalf of the those people who sort of provide the liquidity. So as most of you probably know, an AMM has a pile of two assets and it makes markets between those two assets. But it's also implementing a trading, um, a yield. 
So if, if you were an Apple buyer and seller and the prices of apples were different around the world, you could go around the world buying and selling apples and make a profit. And what you would have is you'd have a pile of apples and a pile of currency, whatever currency you like, euros or dollars, and you would buy apples and your pile of apples would go up and your pile of currency would go down. And you would do that when the price was low. And then you would sell apples, right, when the price of apples was comparatively higher. And if you do that, eventually your pile of, of money will get bigger. And that is essentially what the AMM tries to do. It implements a trading strategy to harvest volatility on behalf of the liquidity providers who loan it assets. All right. I know David speaks a little bit fast, maybe a little bit. He speaks faster than me. So I would say he speaks very fast, Gonzo. But what he's trying to describe there is arbitrage, where I, when something drops in value, you purchase a lot of that asset. Eventually, demand re-enters the market. You can sell that asset for more than you bought it with. That's what's happening in fractions of a second during an automated market maker. It's grabbing a little XRP from this exchange where it's 50 cents and it's selling it to this one where it's 52 and now they're both 51 cents. You got the connection. I, I guess that's the simplest way I would explain a liquidity pool. What is your biggest takeaway from, first of all, David Schwartz optimism when it comes to the automated market maker? And then we're going to get into some of the repercussions and some of the kinks that they went through during this launch because they did run into two key errors that we're going to break down. But I think this is a big, big shift in the integration of real world assets being able to interact with XRP. I want to make this very clear. It can be any two assets that interact with the XRPL can now use the automated market maker. For example, if we had gold, real gold, that was compatible with the XRPL for some reason, you can have it at a certain value here, a certain value there. The XRP in between is what's creating the equal value for that XRP. And this is so funny. I don't know why balloons are going off around me, but that's what really gets me excited, Gonzo. I don't want to get distracted. Floor is yours when it comes to David Schwartz breakdown and all the new utility the AMM can provide. Uh, look, I'll, I'll defer to you for the, um, like the finer details of the automated market maker. Um, but I, I do agree with him that, it, you know, it brings utility, it brings more volume, it brings activity. And that's what you need for like a network effect, right? Um, I, I think they're still trying to work out some of the kinks. That's the story that we're going to talk about. So better they get that stuff worked out early on than when this thing really kicks off and you've got high amounts of volume and money, and, and then you could have something catastrophic that happens and then it turns people away. So better they find that kind of stuff now. And it's cool that they're being open and also the community putting out messages and letting people know so they can get the, the kinks out. Agree with you, Gonzo. And let's read the update right here from Ripple. They stated, we've identified, and I'll move this camera angle. We've identified a discrepancy in a few automated market maker pools in which transactions are not executing as intended. Our engineering team is working to resolve the issue alongside community participants out of an abundance of caution, it's best to not deposit new funds into AMM pools for now, and those holding LP tokens consider redeeming them. We'll provide additional updates on this thread as soon as possible. I feel like I should provide the update here because the issue has been identified, said RippleX on Twitter. The discrepancy affected how the DEX payment engine routes liquidity through the AMM pools and order books in some complex payment path scenarios. We're reviewing the, fix, the proposed fix now with the community, which will then go through the amendment voting process. Appreciate the quick response from community participants, and they tag these participants in spreading the word and acting quickly to close deposit functionality. I guess there's a couple positive things. They're getting in front of it. They're being honest. They're talking about it. We knew it wasn't going to be a perfect launch, but Andrew, I do want to hear your reaction. What do you think about the automated market maker? First of all, finally coming into effect on Friday. Congratulations to the community. Even though we're going through the kinks here, it's, it is a big amendment. But second of all, the fact that they were able to identify the issue, put in a new amendment, and now that new amendment will be voted into effect. So it's pretty good. I mean, it's great. We had to deal with an issue. So people are going to say, well, there shouldn't have been an issue, but there was the issue. And I think the way they handled it was pretty responsible. What sticks out to you, Cashflow? For, for me, it's, it's just normal software development behavior. You know, and this is exactly the difference between software and not hardware stuff. If, if if something in hardware breaks, you know, it deteriorates, you get degradation, depreciation, it gets worse. But if software, if you find a defect in software, you fix it, that defect will never happen again. And if you find the next defect, so the quality of, of software is based on the amount of defects you find over time. And normally the amount of defects go 
go down. So every, maybe in the beginning, when you're in test phase, you find every week a bug. And then you say, OK, I only find the bug in, in every every uh, uh, two weeks and then in three weeks. And then you say, OK, it's time to go live and see how it behaves. Now we see an issue. Is that an, is that an issue? Of course not, because the, you, you are anticipating. Why are you putting this software live also to get the bugs out? And I think they are they are very open and honest about it. So that, that's a good case. So, uh, yeah, I can only uh, applaud them about the way how they're handling it. It would be much worse if we maybe see in 10 years a defect like this, because, yeah, then and there is a lot of uh, uh, traffic there. So, you know, because you cannot yeah, re reverse stuff on the blockchain anymore. So there is the, 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 the issue would be much bigger. But for now, I think. You know, it, it's okay that that de defect happens and just let it happen, let it be, and just continue and, and improve the stuff. I agree with you, Cashflow. And Gonzo, I do want to get into a tokenized asset conversation here, but there's a couple of interesting topics that catch my attention before the end of the show. I want to talk about how mainstream media participants are starting to talk about cryptocurrency, but we also got to break down something interesting right here. Patrick Bet David has become very outspoken about the idea of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and eventually, I think he'll talk about other cryptocurrencies, but he had a great clip and a great short video here with Steve-O where he's describing how Bitcoin's volatility does create opportunity, but he said there's a lot of risk being involved with that asset. I don't think I should, I mean, I guess I can play some of it because it's a little bit longer. Let me play like 40 seconds here and then let me know in the live chat what you think of Patrick Bet David's take. Awesome. And now it's like Jerome Powell comes out and says, wait, we were expecting inflation to slow down. It's not, you know, we may bump it up a quarter of a basis point in the month of may you know who that scares is that why gold is performing the way it is right now have you seen what bitcoin hit i'm yeah. not even a bitcoin guy it's at like 60 so gonzo real quick the reason i put you in the screen is because what he's talking about here is how the federal reserve is killing the dollar and that's going to be positive for bitcoin so i just want to make the conversation really really simple what he's discussing is how the federal reserve is about to lower rates which we broke down at the beginning of the show that's one of the reasons Kathy Wood is also so optimistic about Bitcoin going forward. So I guess I don't really have a comment for you. I wanted to show your beautiful face, but here's the rest of this video. <laughs> we'll discuss it. Here we go. 768 right now. Where is it right now? Price of Bitcoin. It's uh, $67,000 right now. Uh, no, 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 right. I mean, we told Steve to, to buy. buy I, I made a decision 16, to buy 18. Bitcoin at, when it was at 40. And, yeah. uh, and, and my Charles Schwab account was it like uh, i didn't have a checking account i'm like ah, i won't let me use it to buy it and so i didn't <laughs> <laughs> by the way you and millions of others right yeah. you are not alone right right, uh, right so right. this is this is what a lot of people are like well you know it's going to go to ten thousand. but the thing with bitcoin is every time it goes up like this there's the people that pump and dump because it's still not fully regulated so don't be surprised if that 67 becomes 35 again and then goes to 120 and then drops to 73 and then goes to 280 and then drops to 99, then goes to 370. Like that's Bitcoin. So it's it's a very, you know, volatile product. So going back to answering. So I really like that short clip right there, Gonzo, because he talks about volatility, opportunity, 100,000 to 35, 35 to 190, 190 to 73. That makes the regular everyday investor panic because those things don't happen over a short period of time. You're going on these nine month, two year journeys of climbing the hill, riding the roller coaster, climbing the hill down the back end. So I think Patrick but David, first of all, he's been in crypto for quite a while. I watched a video in 2019 of him talking about crypto. But second of all, it's it, it's the most obvious thing in the world. If you're not wealthy, you need to take risk. That's what he's describing in that video. Long story short, floor is yours, Gonzo. Yeah. But what's funny is like for us that have been in this space, like really Bitcoin is uh, risk off, right? Like it's the most stable asset that we have. Yeah, there's volatility over a long time horizon. Like people think it's the four year cycle, even though it's less than four years. But like my opinion is I lean into what Raul Paul talks about, which is the liquidity cycle, the business cycle, right? It's what the Fed is doing. I think it's just coincidence that it kind of falls into the Bitcoin cycle. This cycle will be the first time that we ever really, really see that supply and demand uh, not narrative, but mechanism because of what's happening with the spot ETF. Um, so it's funny because when you look outside of our world, people think that it's super risky, but all you have to do is zoom out, right? If you zoom out, then you see from its existence where it's gone, it's going to go up and down, right? Over a long period of time. 
Um, but that's why, you know, you buy when people are fearful, like what they're talking about when it was at 16, 17, 18,000, that was the time to get into Bitcoin. When it's breaking all time high, we're getting to the end, right? To the end of our cycle. Now's the time to be pulling profits, not to be piling in. But that's the way that it is, right? If you look at our indicator, RSI, right? It, it shows the most oversold is when the price is the highest, right? I'm sorry, overbought. So what is that telling us? That, that's telling us that the most people are buying it at its all-time high. And then when it's at its lowest point, the RSI, it's the most oversold, right? So it's the most that people are selling. But really, it should be the opposite of that. When you're oversold, right, at the bottom, that's when you should be buying. You should be selling when we're overbought. But it just works in the exact opposite. That's why the RSI shows you that. Because people either panic sell right at the bottom or they FOMO in at the top. And that's what RSI basically is. And for anybody who doesn't know what RSI is, is it's a relative strength index. And you can use this to figure out if an asset is overbought or oversold. This is a basic like first grade level understanding of this. If the letter, if the number of the RSI goes below 30, you're in very bearish territory. It means the asset is oversold. When it's nine or when it's 70 or above, that means the asset is overbought and we should have a pullback soon. While I am on the daily RSI for Bitcoin right now, and we are perfect. This actually looks great to me, Gonzo, on a daily time frame. We are sitting at a 53 clear level of support and a level of volatility here when it comes to Bitcoin. But I just pulled it up. We briefly broke above $70,000 just a couple of seconds ago. Now we're trading below that range at $69,800. This is the best thing that we could see when it comes to altcoins as well. What I'd really like to do while we're on screen right now is I want to look at the long-term RSI for XRP just because I find this to be very interesting. We're, we're, we're getting a short squeeze. I think I think the wall was like at 68, between 68 and 69. So as soon as like it broke that, like I think price was going to gap up because we're getting a short squeeze. You got You had that wall of shorts that had come down from like that 70 range to that 69 range, right? There was a lot of liquidity there. So we're probably going to just blow right through that. And I find really, really good, Gonzo. Look at this correlation here that we're seeing. I'm going to make this full screen really quick. What I'm seeing right here is look at where the relative strength index is. It's the same level of support. That 50, that 50 number is pivotal here. Obviously, it's halfway through the ranges. So it's kind of like that support level to see your momentum. If we turn bullish and we go to create new all-time highs, sorry, new relative highs on the RSI, we're going to see XRP get extremely volatile. And we're looking at over two and a half, three years of data on the screen right now. This is not some short-term analysis. Oh, look at the RSI for this week. No, we're looking at long-term timeframes, long-term volatility. What happened back in 2021? XRP went from 17 cents when the RSI was at a 30 all the way to $1.90 where the RSI reached as high as an 86. Today, we are currently sitting at about a 49 to 51 depending on where we are. And I think if we break above that 70 level again, Gonzo, that could take us above these last all-time high ranges here, that 83 to 94 cent level. If we get a breakout that goes through those ranges, it's going to get very, very exciting for the XRP community. And we'll be talking about it almost every day on our show. So why don't you just close this out with the TA and we'll get into another article. Yeah, I like to look at the RSI like on the weekly or the monthly. Because when you look at that, when we're making that bottom there at 16, 70,000, our RSI on the monthly was the most oversold that we'd ever been in the history of Bitcoin, right? Um, and so as it's run up and it's hit into those higher levels, right, like the 80 and above, we usually get into that range twice. And right now when we broke the all-time high on that candle wick and kind of came back down, we kind of entered that area and now we've corrected, kind of created what's called a bearish divergence. What a bearish divergence is, is when price action is going up, but the relative strength of the RSI is going down, right? It causes a bearish divergence because what happens? Price has to now catch up to the RSI. So it goes down. It works in reverse for like a bullish divergence, right? And so um, I think the next time we get peaked out on RSI for high timeframes, I think that'll be the top, right? So we usually get into high RSIs on high timeframes twice. I think we've done it once with this local top and I think we've come down and I think we'll top out again at whatever the next all-time high is. Like, we'll have to play it out. These are super high time frames when you're talking about the monthly um, RSI. It takes months to play out, but that's kind of where we're at. But And Gonzo, I know you got to run. So I want to say thank you for joining us today. And as always, we'll see you again soon whenever you're available. So love thank you, you so much. We love you, man. 
Andrew, to end this show, I wanted to break down a little bit of the Quant Network's price chart because this is a project that we're seeing break out right now. And we've been talking about it for quite a few weeks on our channel. But look at this. Steady momentum, awesome analysis, awesome breakout. This is another token that's yet to really have that first bull run, that first massive bullish wave come into effect. We could be starting it right now. It's a bold prediction, but I think the overall market analysis tells me that projects like Quant are about to take off. This project was trading at, let's just look, three or four days ago, reached as low as $105. Well, today, this project is trading at $143. It's one that we talk about constantly. And what gets me so excited about Quant, Andrew, is two things. First of all, there's only 14.6 million tokens in circulation. There's not going to be new minted tokens coming out of thin air. And there's even less that are circulating on exchanges. Second of all, how low the market cap is. This is a legitimate project run by Gilbert Verdian, who worked with the Federal Reserve for almost five years. He was part of the Secure Payments Task Force back in 2017, even after he created Quant. And so with this project only sitting at $1.6 billion, we're looking at other projects, even like a Chainlink or, a, or an AVAX, which is $20 billion. That's a 20x if that type of liquidity comes into Quant. And if we're seeing Solana break $100 billion, Projects like Quant are going to reach four, five, eight billion dollars just because of the liquidity waves coming into the market. I love this project, and this is one I'm really excited to watch over this bull run. But how do you feel about Quant overall, as well as the analysis we just broke down? I'm a, I'm a Quant investor already for a long time, and I, I probably bought it a little bit too expensive, so uh, I, I, I need to wait. Uh, what you see here in the graph is also a little bit like a, a, a double top. Um, I'm not so sure if it will break out immediately uh, or on, on the short term. I, I don't know. And what I see is those two tops at the end, uh, yeah, a little bit yeah, there. Um, they are not higher than the previous top, that one. So what we need, at least a breakout above that previous top. And then, you know, all the, all the sellers are gone. You know, it's, it's all a matter of buying and selling. So then the sellers are gone. And then the way is uh, the, the the way the road is open for for higher pr price targets. But but still, I think quant is it what what you already said. You know, a fixed uh, fixed one fourteen point six million tokens. It is a nice token to have in your portfolio. Not only quant, but there are m others. But I think yeah, it's a it's a good token. Um, but also have your strategy ready. When do you want to take profits? Also with with quant because. It, it's volatile like uh, like ever. And I want to close out the show by going over our user poll, but let's just read Brad Garlinghouse tweet from last week one more time. This is a really short tweet here. The SEC picked fights with the industry and is losing badly in courts. They're now fighting with fellow regulators like the CFTC and falling behind international counterparts. At what point will the SEC realize they will lose the war against Ethereum just as they lost the war against XRP? strong statements from Brad Garlinghouse. And I just wanted to read that statement real quick. The question that we asked our live chat today was, which price target happens first? XRP to 125, Bitcoin to 100,000, Solana to 300, or Ethereum to six grand? 51% of our users voted XRP to 125 will be the first price target to take place. 30% voted $100,000 Bitcoin and 13% voted $300 Solana. So Andrew, just to close us out, what do you agree with within this poll and what's your reaction to the results? I would I would have them all on those targets. And I know, I think for Bitcoin, it will be the most difficult to reach it, 100,000, because that is such a psychological number. I think there are a lot of selling orders currently already prepared for 92, 95, 97, 98. Uh, uh, then uh, Solana, you know, I love Solana. I'm an early investor in Solana, but still I think XRP will, the, will be the first one for one, uh, 125. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Andrew Cashflow. And I want to say we got 2,231 live listeners joining us. Thank you for being here on this Monday. If you enjoyed this content, show us some love. Smash that like button. And we're going to be breaking down a bunch of stuff this week. We love you guys. We'll see you in 23 hours. And like we always say, warriors, Get your shit together, baby. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Cashflow. Thank you, Epps.